This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 170 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. 170 means it's a special episode, so something a bit different, not my usual bunch of three guests, but a lot of input from a lot of really interesting people about a topic that I decided was important right now because it is January 2020 when I'm recording this and when it comes out. So arguably the beginning of a new decade. I know there's the argument that say, says the decade doesn't really begin till next year, but you know, it's got 20 in it. So let's just assume that we're in a new decade. And I thought it would be interesting to look back on how travel has changed over the last decade because a whole lot has changed. Now, I decided not just to bore you with my thoughts about this, but I've asked a bunch of people I know on uh, who are very wise about all things travel to tell me what they thought has changed a lot in the last decade. Now, I must give a shout out to my lovely friend, Christy. Uh, in fact, Christy was my very first ever guest on the Thoughtful Travel podcast uh, three years ago, and um, we were chatting recently, and I can't quite remember how it came up, but she did say to me, can you remember traveling before the internet? It's so much easier now. And we were talking about things like getting brochures from the travel agent to get the visuals and booking there and all of that kind of stuff that's a whole lot different these days. And I realized that that's, you know, that had started well before 2010, of course, but lots of things to do with the internet and smartphones have really changed a lot of things about travel in the past decade. So anyway, thank you, Christy, for inspiring this topic because I think uh, it's, well, I hope that you find all find it an interesting one. I've got, oh, I think, some really interesting uh, responses to that coming up. But before we get on to the main topic of how travel changed in a decade, a couple of quick things I need to tell you. First of all, some very exciting news. You might remember I had a goal of reaching a quarter of a million downloads by the end of 2019. Now, I was really disappointed because on the end 31st of December 2019, I had like 245,500 downloads, which was close, but you know, not a quarter of a million. And I kind of stopped tracking and stopped looking every day. I'd been looking every day and tracking that uh, the the listens every day. And uh, and just before uh, well, earlier today, I thought, oh, I'll just have a look. And lo and behold, of course, there's been an explosion of listening in that first week of the year. A lot fewer people listened over Christmas. And suddenly we are at the quarter of a million downloads, well over it, in fact. So thank you, everybody. I did a little dance in my office and celebrated and messaged a couple of people who I knew would celebrate with me. So thanks to them. Um, and yeah, so a quarter of a million downloads is pretty awesome. I was talking to my dad about this recently and telling him, you know, he's into his 80s, he's 82 now, and telling him how many thousand people listen every week. And he was kind of blown away. And that was, yeah, I was, it made me feel proud. So a uh, big shout out to all of you wonderful listeners. Thanks for getting me to that quarter of a million downloads. I know I saw a bunch of you sharing um, my podcast, you know, far and wide across your social media channels and stuff. And I really appreciate it. Now, um, that was the positive news. On the downside, I can't really record this episode without mentioning the horrific bushfires that are still ongoing in Australia at the moment. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be over here in Perth in Western Australia, and we haven't had any very serious fires um, in the near uh, in the you know near to Perth, there's been some bad ones in the southwest and over at the border. There's some bad ones. In fact, uh, between that and the cyclone in the north, they're saying that kind of all the roads in and out of our enormous state are closed at the moment. So we're a little bit isolated. But I mean, Perth, we are used to being isolated. We're very very far from anywhere. But um, in terms of the bushfires in the east coast and the eastern states of Australia, truly truly horrifying. In the um, future, when this all calms down a little bit, I um, have already planned a, a future episode of the podcast uh, to encourage some tourism to the bushfire-affected regions. 
Uh, and in fact, I'd already got that underway. And then a few listeners have been in contact with me to suggest the same thing. So that'll be coming out probably February, I'd say. Um, but in the meantime, if you are planning to, can- to travel to Australia, don't cancel. There's still plenty of Australia to see. Uh, you know, don't go into a direct bushfire zone, but, you know, Australia is a huge place and we really need those tourism dollars. It's a really important part of the Australian economy. So please come to my country still. Thank you. All right. So on to how travel has changed in a decade. I gathered a bunch of really interesting answers, mostly from my fellow members of the Australian Society of Travel Writers. I posed the question there and I got so many great answers in a short time that I didn't need to go further until I realised when I sat down to put this episode together that they were all from all from women. And so with only three hours until I needed to record this podcast, I reached out to the fabulous Ian, uh, the barefoot backpacker, you might know him, and he's been on the podcast many times and he runs his own podcast, Travel Tales from Beyond the Brochure. And within minutes, he had not only agreed to talk about it, he had actually recorded his own version about how travel has changed in the last decade and emailed me to say, here it is. Here's my two cents on how travel has changed in a decade. So Ian, thank you. You're a legend. Now I have a man's perspective as well, and it's an interesting one. So I will let Ian uh, have his uh, two cents worth. Here we go. How has travel changed in the last 10 years? Well, you see, I first started traveling in the mid nineties and it was a far different beast then. So on that basis, the last 10 years haven't seen that substantial change for me since I, you know, already seen a lot of the big changes that were being developed. I think it's become easier as quicker mobile phone networks and Wi-Fi have reached into more of the world, making forward planning easier. And I think it's, it's kind of become more accessible. As more people are getting onto sites like Instagram and Twitter, people are seeing more of their friends go to places they'd only previously seen on documentaries or in books. So it's made people realise that even they can take the trips of their dreams. So, yeah, it's an interesting perspective from Ian, and I agree with all of it, in fact. Uh, I feel a bit torn that travel has become more accessible. You know, my big thing is I want everyone to be able to travel more, but in some ways everyone being able to travel more makes it a bit less special. I don't know. I think I'm being selfish, right? Anyway, I want to get on to some of the other really interesting uh, topics that people brought up about how travel has changed in the past decade. I would summarise all of them by saying there's some good and some bad. Nothing has been amazingly, fantastically better, but things haven't got fantastically worse either on the whole. Uh, Kate Hennessy brought up a really interesting point that hadn't occurred to me uh, and pointed me to an article that she had written for the Financial Review. I'll leave a link in the show notes. And the article's titled How Me Too Has Changed the Way Women Travel. And that's really, yeah, I hadn't thought about it, but it's so true. And, you know, she writes about how she notices um, harassment a lot more when she travels. So the article talks, for example, about her experiences in Morocco. And I remember being, you know, well harassed in Tunisia as well. And thinking at the time, that's just a cultural difference. It still is just a cultural difference, I suppose. But now that in our own cultures, we would probably call that out a lot more, thanks to the Me Too movement, then it seems a bit trickier. Um, To be fair, uh, Kate also references some instances in Australia where uh, travellers, especially backpackers, had been, um, you know, the victims of some awful harassment as well. So it's not, uh, it happens everywhere. Uh, But I think uh, one sentence in that article really summarised it well. She said, Kate wrote, "Um, my response to the cat calls post Me Too was angrier and a lot less ambiguous, but my ability to make it stop remained the same, none. And, you know, the cultural, especially if in somewhere like Morocco, you know, can't suddenly stand up to those men who are catcalling you because that's not going to end well. It's still a big cultural difference. So, yeah, it's interesting. There's not much we can do about about some of that at that at this stage, but the awareness is there. So that's something that's definitely changed over the past decade. Uh, now, Monique is um, another uh, Society of Travel Writers member, but she's uh, on the millennial end. She's younger. And uh, she had this really interesting point to say that uh, in her ge- for her generation, the fact that you can now put flights on Afterpay has made this big difference. Now, if you don't know what Afterpay is, uh, there's it's uh, a buy now, pay later scheme. So it's really interesting. 
uh, is very popular in Australia, especially amongst millennials. But um, I think it's also, I tried to do a bit more research, it seems to be taking off in other countries as well. Uh, I found, um, for example, in um, in other places that might, you might use Klarna um, as, a, as a kind of version of Afterpay. But basically you... Um, you use Afterpay, it pays whoever you're buying the, the item off straight away and then you pay it off over the next um, like uh, six weeks or so. So it's sort of like having a credit card but it's not like having a credit card because you just have to pay it in instalments. It's sort of like old-fashioned lay-by. Anyway, that's Afterpay. <laughs> I feel like I have to explain it because I've used it once myself but I'm you know of that generation where it's perhaps not so common. But... Um, Monique was saying that Afterpay has made a big difference because it doesn't feel like you're using a credit card uh, and so that's okay, apparently, Um, but you can put flights on it. So Monique was saying that um, in Australia, for example, it's mostly the budget airlines like Jetstar and Tiger that offer Afterpay and so it sort of has increased the ability of younger people to travel more. Um, you don't have to save up the money first. You can sort of pay it off, but in a different way to using credit cards. So that was fascinating to me that such a thing would be, um, would be well, that it would be a thing. So there you go. And, you know, I do kind of feel like you see a lot of millennial um, generation traveling a lot uh, and perhaps in in more luxury than we would have. In fact, that actually I'm going to skip down to somewhere further down on my list because that kind of ties into the whole flash packer idea. So Silke uh, mentioned that flash packing, you know, kind of a f- fancier version of backpacking was really only just getting started a decade ago. And backpackers these days often expect um, all the trimmings. She gave the example of the Sydney Harbour YHA uh, Youth Hostel, which opened a decade ago. And it was certainly much fancier than your standard old youth hostel. Uh, and even the dorms have ensuite bathrooms these days. Uh, lockers included PowerPoints where you could recharge your devices. So it's kind of a, you know, the new version of backpacking. It's not like when I was a backpacker and we just expected a bed that was vaguely, no, not even comfortable. It just had to be a bed, really. <laughs> just had to be somewhere with walls and a roof that we could sleep. That was like okay for accommodation back when I was a a backpacker in my 20s. So anyway, that's interesting. Now, Christine mentioned travel without social media. So a decade ago, social media was just getting started, uh, was not really making much difference to how we traveled. And especially, oh, good old Instagram these days. So over that decade has made a big difference. Uh, and Christine mentioned things like, you know, doing it for the gram. So the people who want to recreate these amazing Instagram photos they've seen. And, um, and as she grimly mentioned, people dying for the gram, you, you know, it's awful, but sometimes you read these, um, articles about people who've been, you know, out on a, the edge of a cliff or something trying to recreate a photo they've seen and they get, you know, blown off or fall or something like that. I mean, crazy stuff. But definitely that feeling that you need to document your travels as you go and, you know, put up these amazing Instagram photos. I mean, I don't have that urge because my Instagram photos are definitely not amazing, but I do feel that I enjoy um, to some extent posting about my travels while I'm traveling. I kind of enjoy um, the conversations that I have with people about what I'm doing and where I'm doing it at the time. It is a little bit different to posting about it when you go home. Uh, So, yeah, it's changed it. And I I would be hard pushed to travel and not post something to social media. Certainly in the earlier days, I wouldn't post anything until I got home because I felt that was a security risk because then people would know that I was away. Uh, And I don't feel it anymore. I mean, maybe it's still a security risk, but I just always have a house sitter so my house actually isn't empty Uh, but yeah I don't know I don't know if it's a good or bad thing but I kind of like that conversation it's like having a slideshow while you're still on the road and the people who are really interested will um, you know will discuss it with you at the time and I I don't know I kind of like that anyway it's certainly changed a lot in the last decade now, Carmen mentioned that thanks to the Instagram, uh, sorry, thanks to the internet uh, over the last decade, we've become increasingly more informed before we arrive somewhere. 
which is good, as she says, because now you can kind of make the most of the time you have because you've really, you know, been able to do a lot of detailed research first with great ease. But that means we kind of lost that art of discovery. And I agree completely, you know, back in, you know, the early, early to mid 2000s, like the first, you know, 2004, five, even, you know, the internet was around, but certainly smartphones weren't. And you just didn't have that, you know, breadth and depth of information you could get to. And you still did do that kind of discovery travel. But now it's just not the same. And Carmen mentions a, a, a common problems. She says um, she was tricked when she went to Vietnam uh, last year and she went to somewhere that had been labelled the most beautiful spot in Vietnam and uh, on the internet somewhere. And of course, 10 years ago, it was probably paradise, but she said now it's like swimming in a rubbish bin. And worse, she said, it didn't stop the uh, Instagrammers from um, posing and, you know, taking their Instagrammable pictures even as uh, like the debris stuck to their bodies from all the rubbish and pollution there. So that's pretty gross, but sadly true, I think. Um, now, Di also talked about, you know, our reliance on the internet for, you know, getting reviews, leaving reviews, booking, and being much less spontaneous and pre-booking now. And I, you know, I think like I suggest, I have really mixed feelings about that as well. I kind of really miss the let's turn up somewhere and let's just see what happens approach. It's certainly, you know, that just is much, much rarer for people to do that. But on the pro side, I mentioned that we are in general looking for more authentic experiences. So her example was um, less pictures with gladiators at the Colosseum and more eating at little trattorias filled with uh, Italians. And that kind of thing is also something that we can find nowadays because people post about it online. Uh, And she also mentions how much we rely on our phones and uh, maps on the phones, for example. She said, I miss maps. I love a big paper map of a city and can never seem to get my bearings without one. Completely agree. Now, a um, little secret about the bathroom of our house. Uh, we are planning, well, not planning, we are going on a trip to Kuala Lumpur in a couple of weeks. And for this very reason, I've actually got a printed out a map of Kuala Lumpur and it's uh, stuck up on the wall where my son and I can look at it all the time so that we'll have kind of that, you know, mental overview of the city and not just be, you know, looking at one little screenshot on the on our phone of, you know, the immediate area, but we can get a, a broader picture of where we are. Uh, Now, Liz mentions the growing influence of TripAdvisor and probably other review sites as well and all the dangers that come with it from the manipulation or, you know, reviews from ordinary travellers but with blinkers on and with various biases and stuff. Uh, And often they cause, you know, irreparable damage to small tourism operators. So that, um, you know, that whole influence of somewhere as massive and sort of uncontrolled as a site like TripAdvisor, you know, that didn't happen before. We just had no way to, you know, we might be able to ask a few select friends about somewhere they'd been, but now we can ask our thousands of select friends, you know, and strangers on the internet and find out what they thought about a a destination or a restaurant or a museum or whatever or a hotel. And yeah, it's... There's pros and cons. I mean, I think that's the theme of how travel has changed over the decade is there's definitely pros and cons. Speaking of which, Marion mentions Airbnb, which has certainly absolutely taken off this decade, uh, but has now got to the point where it's not necessarily a good thing and can become a problem. But I think the the underlying basis of Airbnb, people looking, as Marion says, looking for extra space or for longer stays or a more local experience, that as a way to travel and not necessarily just staying in hotels has become something that's really popular. It's certainly something I really love. Um, where Airbnb and the likes will go in the next decade will be an interesting thing, I think. Um, now, um, my last uh, little bit of um, contribution came from Emily and she talked about the rise of Google Maps and, you know, definitely, you know, the real, our reliance on smartphones in general. But in terms of Google Maps, she said that she has a rubbish sense of direction 
And this is a really interesting point. She said that her confidence as a solo traveler grew exponentially when she knew she had GPS in her pocket. So she can wander the streets and neighborhoods, um, check out places before she goes using Street View and feel confident that she's not going to get too lost out there. And I love that idea that, you know, having that, you know, the whole information is power thing and having that Conf- increased confidence, especially as a solo traveler, it, that's a really positive thing. And I agree, actually. I have to say, I've noticed that in my travels with my son, which, you know, because he's still young, it's kind of like a solo traveler, but with extra responsibility. <laughs> and, and certainly having, you know, more of that um, ability to find things out wherever you are does make you more confident to just kind of get out there. You know, as a solo traveler pre son, I didn't really care too much if I got lost unless I was kind of in a place where there might be a dangerous end of town, I suppose. But certainly with a with a child in tow, I want to know a bit more about where I am and know that I can, you know, have ways to get out of there without having to necessarily rely on being able to communicate with local people. So um, Emily also mentions the growth in niche travel, which I think is absolutely true and really cool. So, you know, more specific reasons to travel. Her list includes um, food tours, female-only tours, solo tours, wellness holidays, um, you know, swimming, cycling, running holidays, sustainable tours. Uh, I've seen um, recently sole parent tours. I know that, for example, Intrepid offers group tours that are for, you know, solo parents with their kids, which as a a sole parent, I think is absolutely awesome. Uh, so things like that. Uh, and I guess that's partly because of the internet. People can promote these kinds of tours and find enough people who fit that niche. And I think that's really cool because it's, you know, you're more likely to have an amazing trip if you can find a bunch of more like-minded people to travel with. And so that's a you know pretty awesome thing that has developed over the decade. I think it's also part of that. I mean, I think, you know, there's such a growth in thoughtful travel, whether people call it thoughtful travel or not. I think that's what it is. And they're, you know, trying to find different ways to travel. It's not just let's go on a tour and see the Eiffel Tower and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, it's like, oh, let's go and see where can we eat really, you know, the best spaghetti in Italy and where can we go with a bunch of people who have a similar interest to me and, you know, really explore something more in depth. And, you know, I think that's a really positive part of the development of travel in the past decade. So that is the end of uh, a varied bunch of thoughts on how travel has changed over the decade. I think it's been a really interesting decade in travel and I think the coming decade will be even more interesting because, you know, things have to change. You know, we've had it highlighted with the bushfires in Australia that, you know, climate change is a real, really, really here and we need to do some stuff about that really fast. I'm going to have an episode on on that in the near future about, um, you know, what how we can justify travelling in the age of climate change. I think we can um, but with certain caveats, and I'm going to get some other guests on to discuss that issue as well. Uh, but lots of other things are changing as well. It'll be really interesting to see, you know, over the next decade, how travel changes even more. So thank you very much for listening to episode 170 of the Thoughtful Travel podcast. I have a bunch of places I want to send you to, to, um, to find out more about the various people who contributed. All of the links will be in the show notes and the show notes are at notaballerina.com slash 170. But I do want to just give a shout out to all of them because I really appreciate them taking the time to contribute to this episode. So first up, we had Ian from the Barefoot Backpacker and you can find him at barefoot-backpacker.com. Thanks also to Kate Hennessy. I'm leaving a link to her um, Finn Review article about how Me Too has changed the way women travel, but you can find her on Instagram at the smallest room, and that's with underscores between the words. Uh, also, thanks to Monique um, Cercato, and you can find Monique at littlemissmonbon.com. Thanks heaps to Christine of Adventure Baby, and she's at christineknight.me. Also, thanks to Carmen Jenner and Carmen's blog is fluffytowel.com. Big thanks to Di Bordoletto. I'm just going to catch up with Di in a couple of nights and always fun to hang out with you. Thanks, Di. And she's at traveletto.com. Thanks also to Liz and her new website is at lizbondwriter.com. So it's all one word, lizbondwriter.com. 
Also thanks to Marion Rogerson from mumonthemove.com and last but definitely not least to Emily McAuliffe and you can find her at emilymcauliffe.com. Come along to our Facebook group and chat some more about how you think travel has changed this decade. Don't forget our group is Thoughtful Travellers. We're over 800 members strong now. It's such a cool place to hang out. There's a link in the show notes or just search for Thoughtful Travellers in Facebook and ask to join. So that's it for episode 170. I hope that uh, it's given you some food for thought and it's been an interesting interesting thing for me to look back over all the changes of the decade and really appreciate all the great contributions from all those lovely people. So thank you very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.